motherboard you've just seen and the one that's buried in this PC here is the Gigabyte B350 Aorus Pro. This is a new lineup from AMD with the B350 chipset and obviously a new lineup for Gigabyte as well. They've also changed their naming scheme slightly, but basically this is still the sort of gaming pro kind of line that you're used to, just with a slightly different name. Now this board and the others that are in this sort of price bracket with the B450 chipset are the ones that I generally recommend to anyone who is building a PC unless you explicitly want multiple graphics cards and or at least multiple uh, kind of large scale PCs. PCIe usage in your system. If you do need that, then X470, X370 is perfectly fine, but these B450 boards are actually really awesome, a great value for money, and provide great features for the price point. Now, as I said, this is a B450 AORUS Pro, and it actually has some pretty interesting features. The first thing is that while this specific model that I have here is not the Wi-Fi model, there is a Wi-Fi version of the AORUS Pro available, so you can check that out if you fancy, but otherwise you still have a lot of connectivity, a lot of options you actually might not expect so let's do a rundown. So first things first obviously right in the center you have the AM4 socket which supports all of the Ryzen processors from the you know APU side with the uh, video outputs on the back uh, all the way to the 2700X which is what I currently have in here and what I was testing with. Next to that you have four DDR4 RAM DIMM slots they actually explicitly list this as supporting ECC RAM as well so if you did want to throw this in a sort of server application then that is actually a you know option for you which is great to see listed and just above the socket you have the 8 plus 3 phase hybrid PWM power phase design uh, this is actually pretty great as I said I was testing with a 2700X and it handled this just fine the 2700X didn't throttle at all even under Prime 95 full load for an extended period of time the uh, VRMs did get a little bit toasty I think you were looking uh, depending on what time you looked at 60 or 70 degrees but bear in mind that that's with a case with basically no airflow and uh, a few other variables including an AIO cooler as opposed to you know a more stock air cooler but it's still an impressive board and it still handles the 2700X just fine. Some of the other main features the board has is actually down at the bottom left on the audio section where you have a Realtek ALC 1220VB chip. This is one of the best built-in chips that you can get and it's actually impressive to see it on a relatively mainstream level board so that's always great to see. And of of course, if you're into RGB, then you can check out the multiple both addressable and standard common cathode headers that are on the board. You have one on the top right of the board, which is an addressable header. Just to the bottom left of the uh, CPU socket, you have a standard header for your Wraith Spire or uh, Wraith Max coolers or whatever they renamed them to, um, as well as uh, Prism, that's the one, as well as down the bottom, you have another addressable header. So a fair, a fair number of uh, RGB options if you fancy. And also also on the note of the RGB, the chipset heatsink does light up and you can control this through their software both in Windows and in the BIOS. It is actually quite cool, I do actually really like the aesthetic of this one uh, and you do also have the Aorus logo up on the sort of rear IO shroud that lights up as well. Taking a look at the PCIe slot configuration, this is actually fairly, you know, something you should make note of when you're looking at a lot of these boards. Uh, so the first one obviously is a X1 slot, it's a closed back but it's there if you want it. You then have a reinforced X16 size and electrically con connected slot. Just below that you have a 22100 M.2 slot as the first one directly connected to the CPU and that one is a 32 gig port. Um, you also have a large uh, C uh, kind of M.2 heatsink on it with a thermal pad on the bottom so that is also nice to see. Just below that you then have a, an X16 size slot but it's X4 electrically. You then have another M.2 slot this is a 2280 but still does come with a heatsink which is actually quite nice to see as well and then under that you have another x16 length but x4 electrically slot. Now unless AMD has changed how they connect things my understanding is that the x1 the second M.2 slot and the two x16 but x4 slots and um, both are all of those will be connected via the chipset which is only connected via an x4 link so you will either have multiplexing or at very least it will be reduced speeds if you're using all 
all of these, but if you're using just say a graphics card and a single M.2 up the top, then you're going to have a pretty great experience with this. Since we're talking about M.2s and stuff like that, let's take a look at the SATA ports. You have four right angled ones down at the bottom, and then you have two vertical ones just below the 24 pin. This is one of the more kind of budget things that I see motherboard manufacturers do, putting upright ones and also separated ones, but all of these, as far as I'm aware anyway, run through the chipset, so you should still get full speed running all of them. I think the other main thing to note is probably the rear IO. So the first thing you'll notice is that it has the kind of pre-attached IO shield. They've actually made this a little bit better and a good bit easier to install, so I'm actually pretty happy to recommend this, you know, as a kind of pre-installed IO shield motherboard. Um, but otherwise, in terms of the actual IO itself, it is a little bit on the sparse side. You have, I think, four USB 3 ports, uh, one USB 3.1 uh, Type A, and then another Type C port, a couple of display outputs, including DVI and obviously Gigabit Ethernet. It's actually Intel Gigabit Ethernet, which is nice to see, and a full 7.1 audio set. So now we've had a physical tour of the board, let's take a look at the BIOS. Now, this is the fairly standard Gigabyte BIOS. They really haven't changed much, and I, again, I really like to see them improve the user experience a little bit for this. There are a number of other companies, including people like MSI, who make some really nice and very easy to use BIOSes, but either way, this is what it looks like. You have a slide-in tab at the side to see your kind of uh, general information and stats for, say, your CPU, current clock speed and temperature and stuff like that, which is nice to see. You have a little tray down the bottom which can open your QFlash utility or smart fan or easy mode if you fancy. And you can also go through, obviously, all of the tabs at the top. So the MIT tab is the overclocking tab. It does seem to be missing a few options, but that's likely just because this is a very early version of the BIOS and by the time you get your hands on this board, likely have a few more options or at very least just be a little bit more updated. The rest of the BIOS is fairly standard. You do have your AMD CBS option, so you can customize a fair bit, including custom P states, which is obviously nice to see as well, especially with this newer generation of Ryzen. And otherwise, you have your general standard options, the Smart Fan 5 software for customizing your fan curves if you don't have you know, a, a digitally controlled AIO cooler uh, and other things like that, which make the BIOS a little bit more usable. So as I said, in terms of testing this, I, I was using a 2700X and I'm happy to report that this this board hold, handles that just fine and likely even has a bit of room for overclocking if you're doing the more sort of custom XFR overclocking um, that these chips kind of need as opposed to the more standard just set a clock speed and a voltage and kind of let it run with it. Um, so overall I am actually pretty happy to recommend the board. Would I put this in my build? Actually personally I would say yes. I, I don't need Wi-Fi so I don't need the, the Wi-Fi model but it's there if you want it. It's a pretty decent price point. It has a lot of features. I think the only thing that would annoy me is probably the lack of USB ports in the back. There's just a, a fairly small number there and I tend to use a lot of accessories so there's that but otherwise generally I'd be pretty happy to recommend it. If you're interested in picking up the board or if you just want to check out pricing when and where you watch this take a look at the link in the description down below that will take you to your local Amazon store where you can see that. Um, do bear in mind though that this is a launch video so it may not be available just as soon as you watch the video but if you're watching it you know a couple of days or weeks after then you'll likely be able to see availability there. So you've heard my thoughts I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. Are you interested in the B350 platform? Is this you know your next motherboard? Are you excited with you know what AMD and Ryzen is doing for the market or are you you know someone who much prefers Intel? You're sticking with your platform? Let me know in the comments down below. Of course if you have any questions leave them down there too. You can also check out the subscribe button down there as well if you're interested in these videos and plenty of other ones like it on a Monday, Wednesday and Friday basis. If you want to support the channel and keep me making these videos uh, pretty regularly as I said then feel free to take a look at the Patreon link where you can support me directly or the Amazon and Overclockers UK affiliate links which are both in the description and massively help me out when you use them. If you're new to the channel as I said you can hit that subscribe button and you can check out the other videos that are over here. Otherwise, that's pretty much it. Hope you enjoyed it, thank you for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.